First Kings chapter 18. This is one of the greatest chapters in the Old Testament. I'd have to say outside of Isaiah 53, it may be the greatest chapter in the Old Testament. Maybe Psalms 23. But in this chapter, you see where the man of God, against all odds, prays down fire from heaven, and it is finally established in the hearts of the people of Israel that God is the Lord. It's a great chapter, but we won't get to that part. There's something in this chapter I want to look at this morning. We'll begin reading verse number 17. The Bible says, And it came to pass when Ahab, Ahab was the king, saw Elisha, that Ahab said unto him, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but thou and thy father's house, in that ye have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and thou hast followed Balaam. Now therefore send and gather to me all Israel unto Mount Carmel, and the prophets of Baal four hundred and fifty, and the prophets of the groves four hundred, which eat at Jezebel's table. So Ahab sent unto all the children of Israel, and gathered the prophets together unto Mount Carmel. And Elijah came unto all the people, and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And here's the saddest part of this whole text. And the people answered him, not a word. Let's pray. Father, we bless your holy name. We are so thankful to be in the house of God this morning. Our hearts have been touched and been blessed. Thank you for a good Sunday school hour. And God, thank you for some good choir singing, some good congregational singing, some good special singing. Lord, the table of the Lord certainly has been set for the preaching of the word of God. Now, Father, we pray that you'd arrest our attention, and more importantly, you'd arrest our hearts. Help us not to be like this crowd, who answers not a word, but help us, God, to become doers of the Word of God. Help us to be a light in these dark times. Lord, we face in a, a day of uncertainty. Lord, there's a lot of confusion in our day. Lord, there's a lot of fear in our day. God, there's a lot of folks seeking answers. So God, help us to point them to you. God, you're the answer for every need of everyone's life. God, if we would truly recognize that and seek ye first in the kingdom of God and your righteousness, uh, we'd put you first in our lives. Uh, and Father, we'd find we'd live the best life that you could ever live this side of eternity. Now, Father, help us today. Lord, I fear there are some of your children here today who need some help. I pray you'd help them. Lord, I pray you'd speak to hearts and you'd encourage and edify. Then, Father, I pray for someone who may be struggling that, God, you would certainly go by their way and help them with their struggles. Help them to see that, Lord, you're not only carrying their load, you're carrying them. And then, Father, we certainly pray in a crowd this size, if there's somebody unsaved, God, you'd save them. And God, we pray that, Lord, you'd touch their hearts and help them to see their lost condition and help them to find an altar of repentance. For, Lord, we know you came seeking to save that which was lost. Now, Father, we pray for these prayer requests. I pray for my father-in-law. You touch him today. I pray for Brother R.C. You touch him I pray for Miss Riley's sister-in-law and the baby that, God, you'd be with them and touch them. Father, I pray for Miss Nancy that, Lord, you would help her and touch her. Then, Father, I pray for uh, uh, Brother Joe Andrews, uh, uh, member, the lady who's pregnant that has the virus, that you'd be with her and the baby. I pray for Brother Jason Moore, my preacher friend, you'd touch him and help him this morning. Others, Lord, uh, are sick. Others are providentially hindered. I pray for the Woodyards, uh, their children. Uh, then, Father, I pray for those that God may be watching via live stream, that, God, you would help them. 
But Lord, for the next few minutes, I pray you'd sit down amongst us. Uh, you'd touch our stony hearts. Uh, and God, you'd help us to see that our salvation is nearer than when we believed. Uh, and help us, Lord, to truly glean from the things of God. We'll bless you and praise you for it. Use this unworthy vessel and we'll give you the glory. For it's in Jesus' wonderful and holy name we do pray. Amen. Amen. I want to show you a few things as a way of introduction this morning. Uh, I want you to notice, first of all, the accusation. Uh, here we find Ahab, uh, who's one of the most wicked kings that Israel ever knew. Uh, he sees the man of God, Elisha, coming uh, into uh, 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 the uh, uh, city there. Uh, and this is what he accuses him of. Look what he says in verse 17. Uh, uh, and he, uh, he said that it came to pass when Ahab saw Elisha uh, that Ahab said unto him, Art thou he uh, that troubleth Israel? Uh, kind of sounds to me like the king's got a problem with the godly crowd. Uh, 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 it kind of sounds to me uh, uh, like the king is basing all the problems uh, that's going on in the land uh, on this godly man. Uh, uh, you see, uh, uh, he came to that conclusion uh, because Israel's going in the wrong direction. Uh, Israel's following after Balaam. Uh, Israel's being led away from God. Uh, but God raised up a prophet. Uh, and can I say this? Uh, God's always got a man. God's always got a remnant. God's always got a word. And can I say, God raised up the man. And Elijah, listening to the voice of God, God said, get down there by the brook chariot. And Elijah prayed that it wouldn't rain. And it didn't rain for three years. God's getting their attention. You know what gets your attention? A good drought. A good drought when things get dry. When things get arid, uh, uh, can I say uh, there's a drought in America today uh, for righteousness, uh, for holiness, uh, uh, for the love of God to be spread. Uh, he's blaming God's man for his own wickedness. Mm. Isn't it amazing the first shutdown they blame churches? Well, they can't touch churches. Uh, court's already settled that so now they're blaming restaurants you know what the problem is uh, let me show you we see the accusation now look at the answer look at verse 18 the Bible says and he answered I have not troubled Israel uh, but thou uh, and thy father's house uh, in that you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord uh, and thou hast followed Balaam uh, can I help you with something uh, churches aren't the problem uh, restaurants aren't the problem uh, wickedness in high places is the problem uh, uh, they've not sought after God uh, I haven't heard our governor say uh, hey let's all gather at the capitol uh, and let's get a hold of God uh, and ask God to breathe on our state uh, ask God to eradicate the virus uh, ask God to take control uh, hey business would pick up in Kentucky uh, and business would pick up in America if we get on our knees uh, and begin to beseech God uh, and ask God to do for us what we cannot do for ourselves they're passing the buck you know what the problem is lack of faith mm. we see the accusation we see the actuality mm. the problem was Ahab not the man of God Notice the assembly. Look what the man of God asked for. Look at verse 19. Now therefore sin and gathered me all Israel unto Mount Carmel and the prophets of Baal 450 and the prophets of the groves 400 which eat at Jezebel's table. So Ahab uh, uh, sent unto all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together unto Mount Carmel. All Israel comes out and the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of the groves. Now see, this is often preached that uh, uh, Elijah defeated the 400 prophets, 450 prophets of Baal. He did. But they never mentioned him 400 prophets of the groves. The groves is where they'd go and offer up false worship to Balaam. And the groves were uh, a lot of decorated trees. We would know them today as totem poles. 
and they'd pray to them false gods of wood. Uh, and they'd offer up sacrifice. Uh, and Brother Bob, they even offered up their children as sacrifice to false god. Uh, mm, don't look down on them. A lot of people in America are offering up their children to the devil. Oh, they're not burning them. Uh, but they're letting the devil and the devil's crowd have their children. Uh, this ain't in my notes, but let me help you something. If your children do this more than they seek after God, you're giving them to the devil. If your children are more involved in anything other than God, you're giving them to the devil. Do you know everything in this society is geared toward robbing people from the things of God? You think bringing them to Sunday school and bringing them to children's clubs is going to help them? Well, it'll help them. But you're giving them three hours. But then you're giving them 160-something hours to the devil. Boy, that went over good, didn't it? Hmm? Huh? I remember we was in the old building. I warned some parents about letting your children read that Harry Potter garbage. Kids read that Harry Potter garbage and come out and said, oh, we don't want Jesus Christ, he's stupid. We want Harry Potter, he knows magic. And I warned you about some of that stuff. And some of you let your kids read it anyway. And you wonder why they're not in church today. Mm. I warned you about going and seeing that movie, The Passion of Christ. It wasn't a biblical movie. It was a Catholic mass displayed on screen. But yet, you had to go see it. And you have a tainted view of Calvary. When I preach on Jesus, you see that actor uh, uh, on that movie in your mind. Jordan preached a message about t five, six years ago about idols uh, and how uh, when you pray, you're praying to some statue in your mind. You're praying to some picture of Jesus you've seen in your mind. That's not Jesus. Uh, he's altogether lovely. Uh, uh, his hair's white as wool. His countenance is as brass. Uh, his eyes are as flames of fire. Uh, uh, you've got an idol in your mind. And go study the Bible, what it says about idols. I'm just trying to help you this morning. You're giving yourself and your children over to the world and over to the flesh and over to the devil and you don't even realize it. Uh, how much of yourself do you give to God? Oh, my is right, Brother Phil. We see he assembles everybody because he's about ready to set the record straight. Notice the address he gives to this crowd. Look at verse 21. And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. If, but if Baal, then follow him. See, they was wanting to be known as God's chosen people, but they were worshiping Baal. Jesus said, A man can't have two masters. You'll love one and hate the other. Mm -mm. Some of you still hung up on that Harry Potter jump. The altar is open. That's wickedness. You know, the woman that wrote that series is a devil worshiper. Mm. Say, well, it doesn't affect me. Hogwash, it did. That's why you're mad right now. Mm. Mm. You're welcome. didn't cost you anything. He addressed them. He gave them a charge. How long halts you between two opinions? God's God, serve Him. If Baal's God, follow Him. Notice their answer. And they answered him not a word. You know one of the saddest things in America? All across this great land, there are men standing behind pulpits preaching the word of God, and people don't respond. They'll leave the sanctuary, they'll go get in their car, and they'll go on with their, their day and never give any thought to what was just presented to them. They answer not a word. I'm interested, though, in verse 21, where he said, How long halt ye between two opinions? Notice the timing. He says, How long? Let me ask you this morning. How long are you just going to keep playing games with the things of God? We had five revival meetings this summer, and you're no closer to God now than you was before all that started. 
as soon as they were over, you went right back to where you were. How long are you going to do that? How long are you going to come to church on Sunday and sing, Oh, how I love Jesus, and then on Monday start living like the devil again? How long are you going to do that? Aren't you tired of it? Aren't you tired of the mess? Aren't you tired of that lifestyle? Aren't you tired of, uh, uh, of just not having any joy, any victory, any hope? How long? Then I thought about this. Notice the teetering. How long halts ye between two opinions? They're trying to straddle the fence. They're teeter-tottering. Some of you are doing that. When you're around church people, you want to be churchy. When you're not around church people, you want to be worldly. That's a miserable state. Elijah realized that. He said, make up your mind. Get on one side of the fence or the other. Either go all in for God or go all in for the devil, but make up your mind. Quit playing church. We see the timing. We see the teetering. Now notice the thought. Two opinions. If the Lord be God, follow Him. Baal be God, follow Him. You see, in most cases, Brother Mike, people have the mindset that it's just our opinion. That church thing, I, well, that's your opinion. Jesus is Lord, that's your opinion. It's always right to do right, well, that's your opinion. And then they'll listen to the world's philosophy. Well, that's their opinion. Can I say, if you're caught up on opinions, you're in bad shape. We're not preaching opinions today. We're preaching on what thus saith the Lord. And the Lord is not an opinion. He's the King of glory. Uh, and if it's still an opinion with you, you're in bad shape. Uh, well, that Harry Potter thing is Brother Doug's opinion. If Baal be God, follow him. Huh? If devil worship and all devil magic and all that stuff, if that's real and that's what you're into, follow that. But as for me and my house, we shall serve the Lord. Huh? And at the judgment seat, you'll look at me and say, I wish I'd listened to him. Hmm? I ought to preach with God's help and halt between two opinions. Halt between two opinions. That word halt is an interesting word. It has a threefold meaning. Can I say, first of all, it has a military meaning or a military term. The word halt means to stop. If... Uh, there's a war going on and one soldier looks at an opposing soldier and says halt then that opposing soldier will drop his weapon and be taken into imprisonment and become a prisoner of war if he doesn't halt he's going to eat some lead the word halt means stop is a military term that word also has, it's a horseman's term if you show horses, ride horses, you tell that horse to halt, that means to stand pat. Don't go any further. Don't do anything else. Stand pat. It's also a medical term. If somebody is halt, that means they're lame. It means they have a limp. Or in... Matt Dillon's deputy's case, a, a gimp. You remember Israel, when he was Jacob, he wrestled with the Lord, and the Lord touched his thigh, and he was halt the rest of his life. He had a limp. as a military term. Now can I say, as God's people, there are sometimes we need to stop. 
having done all to stand, stand still. We just, sometimes we just need to stop. As God's people, sometimes we need to stand pat, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. And sometimes as God's people, we'll stumble. We'll become a halt. And I've got good news. If you stumble, there's one who'll catch you. But I'm interested on why some people are halt between two opinions. Why they just stand on the fence and they won't make up their mind. Why they won't seek after God, Brother Bob, or make up their mind, I'm going all in with Jesus. I'm getting in deep water. I'm just going to live by faith. How come some do and some don't? I'm interested in that this morning. Can I say that some are halt between two opinions because of fear? They're afraid. The fear of not knowing. Is God really real? Will Jesus Christ really save me? Will His blood wash away all my sin? Will I truly have this bondage broken in my life? They're fearful. They don't know. You remember when you wasn't saved? Remember when you'd come to church and you'd hear the preacher preach and you just didn't know if it was real or not? Aren't you glad you made that step? Hmm? Aren't you glad you can testify today? It's real. It's real. Hallelujah. It's real. But there's some people who are afraid. There's some people that have a fear of making the wrong decision. So they don't make any decision. There's some people who hate decisions. They just hate making decisions. Huh? You go out with them. You say, okay, where would you like to eat? I don't care. But don't ask me that. I'm going to tell you. There's some places I don't want to eat. Now, I'm not real picky. But if it came from where M Miss Melissa comes from, or anything on that side of the hemisphere, I'm not eating it. I don't eat them, them, them eggs with the ducks in them. I don't eat that stuff. And, 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 and I, don't, I don't eat cat. I don't eat dog. And I don't eat worms. I don't eat grasshoppers. Even if you put them in chocolate, I'm not going to eat them. Uh, so if you ask me, I'll make a decision. I'm American. Beef always works. But when it comes to the matters of the soul, there are some people who are afraid to make the wrong decision. Aren't you glad for the Holy Ghost that deals with our hearts, that woos us, that convinces us? That word conviction really means convinces. He convinces us to put our faith in Jesus. Can I say there are some who are afraid of making the wrong decision. There are some who are afraid of what others will think. Now, you can stand here all day and say you're independent and you don't really care what anybody says, but that's not true. There are some people who are afraid of what others think, and we all are concerned about how others see us. Hmm? That's why you take a bath. That's why you get a haircut. That's why you brush your teeth. You are concerned. Number one, you want to feel clean, but number two, you don't want people to really social distance from you. Uh, there are people who are afraid of what others think. There are folks that will come in a crowd this size and say, well, if I go forward and I, I do business with God, what will these people think of me? Now, you and I that have done business with God, we know this, this crowd would be excited. This crowd would be for you. But sitting on the other side of that fence, you don't know that. The Bible says in Proverbs 29, 25, the fear of man bringeth a snare but whosoever putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. But that snare is there. You are ensnared when you fear what others think. And there are some people who are afraid who they may disappoint. If I go in all in for God, I may disappoint somebody. Or if I don't go in all in for God, I may disappoint somebody. That's why they don't do anything. Some people are halt between two opinions because of fear. 
Can I say this? There are some people who are hot between two opinions because there's a failure of them to be convinced. You see, some people aren't convinced Jesus is the right way, the only way, the true way, even though he said, I am the life, the truth, the way. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. There's some people not convinced of that because they watch so-called believers. Hmm? I'll tell you something. I've seen people that claim to be saved, that if I wasn't saved and I watched their life, I'd never trust in Jesus. I, let me help you with this. I've seen preachers that claim to be saved, claim to be a man of God. If I wasn't saved and I listened to that guy, I'd never gotten saved. I've known preachers treat people terrible. I mean, as long as they think you're clean and as long as you're going to church and as long as you pay your tithe, they're for you. But you get a little problem in their life, they'll cut you right now. That's not a man of God. That's a hireling. That's a heretic. And there are some people halt between two opinions because they've watched people who claim to be believers. And I say this. Some haven't been convinced because so many believers are passive. So many believers are halt between two opinions. Remember last week when I preached on Lazarus at the gate? He never convinced that rich man, you need to be saved. Some, some folks never tell anybody about Jesus. They're passive. Some people never shine for Jesus. Some people never, ever promote Jesus to lost folks. Thought about this. Some believers are passive. Some are preoccupied. You know one of the greatest tools of the devil in this day and age is he's made Christians so busy they forgot to be Christian. Let me ask you, anybody got enough time on your hands? We're running at warp speed. And if we're honest, most of what we're running at warp speed towards has nothing to do with the kingdom of heaven. And we get so preoccupied that we forget people are dying and going to hell. You know, the Bible says we're written epistles known and read of all men. There are people reading your life. There are people watching your life. And if you're not convincing them Jesus is the only way, they're going to die and go to hell. They might be halt between two opinions and they're just watching your life to see if what you got's real. And then too many believers are also polluted. You know, you can't shine for Jesus when you're dirty on the inside. Hmm? Can I help you something? When you got sin in your life, you don't read the Bible. When you got sin in your life, you don't pray like you should. And when you got sin in your life, you're not trying to win somebody else to God. You know what you do when you got sin in your life? You sin. Hmm? Somebody's watching you. Might be your neighbor. Might be your coworker. Might be your family. Might be your children. Might be your grandchildren. Somebody's watching you. Are you pointing them to Jesus? Why are so many halt between two opinions? Some of a fear. Some of them they just got had a failure to be convinced. Some are halt between two opinions because of false beliefs. teaching on Wednesday nights on Baptist distinctives because there are over 300 different religions and denominations in America. A lot of people are being misled. A lot of good people being misled, mistaught. There are a lot of you sitting here today that was raised to believe something that's not in the Bible. You know, I, I heard when I was a kid from some guy that was supposedly a deacon in church that the Spirit of God flows breast to breast. There's only one problem. That's not in the Bible. That guy was a deacon. Hmm? Can I say there are some things in the Bible that are not easy to understand? And there are some things in the Bible we really won't know until Jesus comes. 
But a whole lot of this Bible you can't understand. If you seek, you will find. But there's a lot of people that's been mistaught. Some people are taught you can endure till the end. You'll be saved. Well, good luck with that. No, you're going to endure till the end and die and go to hell. I don't have to endure because Jesus paid my price. But some just have some false beliefs. They've just been mistaught. That don't make them wicked. It just means they've been mistaught. That's why God gave us a Bible. So we could tell them and show them the truth. There are some people halt between two opinions because of their family and friends. Never underestimate the power of peer pressure. Hmm. Hey, Donald Trump Jr. By the way, he has COVID. Jr. does. Listen to me. When you started studying the Bible... Brother Stephen started showing you things and teaching you things. Was your family really excited about that? No. You probably faced a little pushback. But there was something in that Bible just kept pulling you. And when you believed on the Lord, now your family sees the difference, don't they? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Praise the Lord exactly that he kept sticking his nose in that Bible and letting Brother Stephen show him some truths and he put his faith in the Lord. He didn't listen to family and friends. He listened to what the Lord was saying. But so many people, they'll listen to family and friends and they'll stay halt between two opinions. It's a dangerous thing. I'm not telling you don't love your family. Love your family. I'm not telling you don't, don't care about your friends. Care about your friends. But when it comes to your soul, you better listen to what Jesus says. I thought about this. Some people are halt between two opinions because of forgetfulness. They just get distracted. They've heard it. They know they need to do business with the Lord. They just don't have time right now. They're just distracted. They got everything else in the world going on. I know a lot of good people have good intentions to come to church, do business with God. Y'all know I do a little work at funeral home. There's one of the guys that, that runs the escort. You know, he's got drives a motorcycle in front of the hearse, and those guys are crazy. The way they'll run in, in, down the yellow line and the way they'll stop traffic and the way they do it, them guys are crazy. They're, they got a screw loose. Well, this one guy, he is, he is so much fun to be around. He was a police officer in Washington, D.C. for 20-something years, retired, somehow ended up here, and he drives that motorcycle, and he's crazy. He really is. Every time he sees me, he says, I'm going to come visit your church. I just saw him last week. He said, I, I lost your card. So I wrote down again the name of the church, the address. He said, I'll be there next Sunday. I hope he does. I'm afraid he just gets distracted. I have other friends that said, Preacher, I'm going to come down there and visit your church. They have yet to show up. They're good people. They just get distracted. Something gets in their way. You know why we ought to want to have revival? So the power of God is so strong that it supersedes people's distractions. Do you know when something's on fire, people will stop what they're doing to watch it burn? We need to get on fire for God so people stop what they're doing and come out and see what's going on. You know, I thought about this last thing. You know why some are halt between two opinions? And here it is in a nutshell. This one's the mother lobe. Fear, certainly number one. Or it might take a back seat to this one. There are some people who won't get right with God because they'll have to forsake their current lifestyle. Listen, I've been studying this book 47 years. 
I don't understand it all. But I've come to learn this, Miss Melissa. There's two reasons why people won't get saved. Number one, they fully don't understand what it takes to be saved. They've never seen a clear-cut presentation of the gospel. And the second reason, they love their sin more than they love the thought of being saved from their sin. See, some people won't get right with God because they know they can't live how they're living and be right with God. Hmm? I'll never forget out on visitation years ago. Met this young lady and another preacher. Knocked on her door. Or talked to her about the Lord. Biting her to church. I'll never forget this young lady started weeping. Brother James, I mean, she's weeping. And we, we shared the gospel with her. She said she knew that she needed to be saved. But she wouldn't get saved because she was living with a man. And she knew if she got saved, she'd have to turn from that. We didn't bring that up, but she knew that. And she wouldn't get right with God because she'd have to forsake her lifestyle. I learned a great truth that night. There's some people that get so close to the Lord but reject Him because they won't reject what's keeping them from the Lord. Friend, whatever it is, it's not worth it. See, it falls back into fear, Brother Tommy. If I trust in the Lord and forsake my lifestyle, what's going to happen in my life? I got news for you. You can, you can not only trust Him with your soul, you can trust Him with your life. Yeah, he can handle it. You know? Hey, when you become a new creature in Christ, it really don't matter anymore because you know Him. But He takes care of all of it. He breaks the bondage and the chains of all of it if we'll just give our heart to the Lord. Some won't. Because they won't forsake. Some won't forsake the bottle. Oh, Donald, I'm glad you did. Some won't forsake the needle. Some won't forsake their living situation. Some won't forsake other habits. They just won't forsake it. But I got news with you, for you. If you just give your heart to Jesus, He breaks all those chains. Those things you think you can't live without, they'll become insignificant if you just give your life to the Lord. So I wonder this morning, are you halt between two opinions? Are you straddling the fence with Jesus? Say, preacher, I'm saved. Wonderful. Are you living for God? Well, if you're not, today would be a good day to get off that fence. But maybe you're here today and you've been letting something keep you from Jesus. Friend, don't wait it don't wait too long. Matter of fact, he said, How long halt you? You've been waiting too long already. Why don't you just give your life to the Lord? Say, preacher, I've got so many questions. Well, he's the answer. If you just give your heart to him, a lot of them questions, they'll be they'll be answered. If not, he's got a book that'll answer them for you. Don't, don't stay on the fence. Just give your life to Jesus. Be the best day of your life. Christian friend, what are you doing to convince people that Jesus is the way? If you can't look around this world and see that Jesus is coming soon, something's wrong. Friend, I'm telling you, this world's in chaos. But one day the Prince of Peace is coming. Could be today. Do you know him? Don't be on the fence today. Why don't you come? Why don't you say, Lord, make me a better witness. Lord, help me to shine for you so others can. Lord, set me on fire that others will come around and see what you're doing. Why don't you ask God to help you in that area? If you're here today, you don't know Jesus. Why don't you come? Let's take a Bible, show you how to be saved. You can be saved today. You can have your sins washed away today. You can have the chains broken in your life today. Uh, religion won't save you. Baptism won't save you. Church membership won't save you, but Jesus will. You can have your life changed today if you'll come to Jesus. Will you come? Let's all stand. Brother Ray, come get a song of invitation. While they're picking out a song, let's pray. Father, we bless you.
Lord, there's been times in my life I've been halt between two opinions. Lord, I don't want to ever be that way again. Lord, your way is right and your way is sure. Help us to walk in your way. God, I pray for Christians today to be set on fire. I pray they get off the fence, quit giving so much time to the world. And Lord, they just sell out for Christ. Lord, I pray for these young people, Lord, you'd set them ablaze for Christ. God, I do pray, and Lord, I don't know the heart of anybody here today. But Lord, I do pray for somebody here that doesn't know you. And they're halt between two opinions. I pray today they just decide Jesus and put their faith and trust in him. Lord, bless in this invitation. Speak to hearts. Lord, help us to go out of here being settled, steadfast, and sure in the things of God. Lord, speak to hearts now. Have your way. We'll bless you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you enjoyed today's message, head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on sermons. And don't forget to check out our other links in the notes section of today's broadcast. As always, thanks for listening.